Hello, everyone. Mo, me, actually, hello, buttercups. <laughs> or buttercup, whichever you want to say. I'm a buttercup. Yay, buttercups. <laughs> Thank you for joining the interview with a fox. This is the first episode ever with Adam. And really, this is just, we're winging it. We're having fun. We're hanging out. But I will ask, not just with this episode but all episodes one for sure pre-planned question and then we go from there which is how did we meet and i have an understanding how uh we met but do you want to go into it with like the cool youtube algorithms that i have always tried to work on but for this video in particular the one that he's going to talk about it actually worked <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, I started BookTube almost a year ago. Uh, I think I started like in July of last year. And um, I, I just started kind of getting into tags. And I saw that, like, you know, kind of one of your uh, first things that you do is create a tag and just kind of get it out there so folks can start interacting with your site a little more. I wanted to create like a heavy metal book tag. And I was, uh, um, starting to kind of build it out. And then I was just like, you know what? I bet you somebody else has come up with a metal tag. So I searched on the algorithm for heavy metal book tags. And the first person that I found was Nicole's book tag. And Nicole is awesome. Like I, I was immediately like going, I, I like this person, Nicole is rad. Um, and I did her book tag immediately. And that's how I tagged her in it. And we uh, immediately kind of hit it off, you know, because she has cool taste in music. So like already I'm just like, yeah, Nicole's cool. Nicole's red. Um, so that's how we met. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we started talking more after I started my uh, Kenny Vloggins vlog. <laughs> 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 and then I think uh, it felt like me and Nicole will just kind of start vibing on just the, the funniness of things. Uh, Nicole's got a great sense of humor. It's, it's really easy to just kind of um, to, to, to vibe on, on that kind of stuff. So we started calling each other Danger Zone. So every once in a while, <laughs> I will be referring to you as Danger Zone throughout the end. Oh yeah, too bad my name isn't Lana because then that would that would work out very well. But <laughs> I was actually thinking if I ever had a girl, would I name her Lana? And then someone <laughs> said, don't do it. And it, because mm. you go, you make it backwards. What does that word say? And, oh, and, and I'm just like, why did I even think uh, of that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, okay, never mind. I don't. And then do we want to be known as the, uh, the girl with like referencing danger zone from Archer? I don't mm -hmm. know. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> there's something to be said about that kind of infamy too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, for the, um, what's that called for that? tag it was really random what song was i it, always it's either one song from those three tags that i've done one is the metal on rock songs rock on metal songs and then the newest one is punk punk on rock punk songs punk. yeah i can't keep <laughs> i can't keep up what am i doing um i think there might i think that might be it because i can't think of like i'm not i don't listen to pop songs so that wouldn't work maybe country. Mm. I don't know. But for sure, those three. I always have a song that I'm listening to that I then create the tag. And mm -hmm. I don't remember what the metal song was. Mm. Uh, but I, I know for the punk, no. The one, you know, the rock one, it was Sick Boys by Social Distortion, and it was on repeat. Right. And I was like, wait, I can just, let's do another tag. Do it. Yes. Do it. Nice. And, um, but I think a lot of people, because I've gotten a, quite a few, especially when I was on Twitter, but I'm not on Twitter anymore. This, that was a long time ago, uh, where they were surprised that I would listen to anything other than like pop which i was mm. like why you think so and they're like well you know like um um <laughs> and they just don't want to say because i don't look stereotypical of 
metal punk rock and i'm like yeah maybe you should think about that <laughs> before you do some assumptions because that's a, that was it's it happened four times and it it's a little weird i don't really <laughs> and i don't think that way i think because i ha uh, came up in dc and you don't think that me looking as i do that i would be living in not so great neighborhoods in dc or around dc um so and then that's also like the kids that i went to school with all the time you assume one thing and that's not it at all so i totally. so I, I i just i learned from a younger age don't assume and get to know people and totally. i think that the booktube kind of author tube i don't really do too much writing stuff but i think people are surprised at a lot of things but i think that's a, a good thing because you kind of have to think about oh she listens to metal like sometimes death metal i i, I enjoy a dying fetus every now and again um <laughs> but but not too much uh not too much else uh but oh and then she reads the most random genres right because i'm pretty i read widely um pretty broad spectrum yeah yes and i think oh that's great yeah and i i just love books and i love music but i'm not a musician are you a musician or no, no? no yeah. i don't play any instruments i mean i i sing uh oh, with yeah. like some of the shows that i do and i've been in a couple bands uh, but mm. i've never been able to play an instrument i'm sad about that it's one of those yeah. things that i think i'm gonna i want to get done before before it's all said and done mm -hmm. i'd like to at least learn something um like drums or bass or something like that or guitar i was thinking you but, look like a bassist for some reason that's what i get it might be the I little get beard a lot. Get that a lot yeah like this is the bassist thing right yeah yeah and people assume that i listen to like nothing but metal just because like i've got that kind of you know, long hair, you know, yeah, faces, tin fuzz, you know. Uh, but I listen to a lot of stuff too. I got a pretty broad spectrum of music that I like to listen to. Yeah, and also reading oh. as well, right? Yeah, I same, so. same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I haven't gone to a lot of concerts, but the metalheads and rockers and punks usually sweet people. You wouldn't think that yeah. way, but Oh, they're so just so adorable. Yeah. Whenever I see, <laughs> whenever I see yeah, like right. a metal head with really long hair and you get that like good beard, and they're just like, "Hi, mm. how are you? You're so welcome. <laughs> we're we just love to see just everyone at this concert, totally. and we're like, thank you. I am gonna enjoy it because yeah, you yeah. are so <laughs> welcoming, <laughs> but you wouldn't think so, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And you get to I, I've, re I've read things and I've seen like little video essays about how metalheads tend to be folks that are a little bit more mentally like um, stable is not the right word, uh, like uh, just kind of uh, happier people mm -hmm. uh, because they tend to vent a lot of their frustrations in and around their music. And uh, because of that, they're not like bottling up a lot of like rage like rage is part of their expression yeah right yeah. so like they 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 deal with it that way and they tend to be happier folks or that's what i've 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 read about and seen yeah yeah same i yeah. think also because the um they're letting out their anger in a safe way totally and through art and even and in a community yeah mm -hmm. way like you know with friends with with other folks yeah and even yeah. uh, mosh pits, there are like, well, if it's a good band, like watching over the mosh pit, which, you know, you have to multitask, but I think uh, most bands do it very well, especially Slipknot. Um, they're watching, they're, they're singing, they're watching the mosh pit, but then also the people that are in the mosh pit, there's rules and regulations. And if you don't follow those rules, then you're out. And you will be you're out. pushed out. You're not like, oh, can you leave? Like, no, you just elbowed someone in the face. You're out. That's not yeah, totally. acceptable. Um, so even like getting out the anger in the mosh pit is regulated or 
in a safe yeah, way. Totally. I think like self-regulating mm -hmm. too. It's the, the community regulating itself. Yeah, I think I don't know uh why, but this it's satisfying to see the um those videos. I think it is it rock fee. I follow two like rock and metal YouTube um channels where mm. they on occasion will show like um it's it's not even clickbait baity titles but like the bands or musicians who will stop fights or stop their show because of an emergency or uh someone's being harassed in the mosh pit and i'm just like right. that's how you do it and yeah. i'm looking at like pop even i don't know why but like pop or just any other um genre where people get hurt all the time and it's like you should be watching that. I don't know, but you'd, I guess you wouldn't think pop or other um, concerts would be dangerous, but you have to, I mean, there's huge pop people and they're gonna punch and yeah. shove and you have to, so everyone has to self-regulate and the band has to regulate that. And that's a lot, but um, yeah, I think there was like uh, somewhat recently <laughs> where the, uh, Slipknot maggots put, and they call themselves out of it. That's so great. Um, they set stuff on fire, and we were like, why did you set stuff on fire in their mosh pit? And right. Ori Taylor was like, we're Which stopping. We you can't do that. You can't set <laughs> shit on fire. What is your problem? <laughs> and it's like, yes, <laughs> actions have consequences. Even at a Slipknot concert, you can't light stuff on fire and try and create a yeah. bonfire. It's not appropriate. <laughs> a bonfire. A bonfire. Yes. And then you're you're good. It may sound metal, you guys. Yeah. I know it sounds metal and all, but, but come you on. can't do that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but I think uh yeah, I would say music and literature for me, I know other people were maybe be like literature and sewing or literature and sculpting i don't know uh would be like their safe avenues um of art but i go with uh music and books and i would say you, you do some sculpture though right i saw you you had some oh there's like that note on this side that right yeah. there that's uh i do ceramics count as sculpture i'm thinking like oh. i don't know Kind of. You're thinking about like bronze. Yes. And yes. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think of. Cool. I like I'm pottery ceramics. That was a long time ago. Mm. Um, and I can't find any like uh, potter, like where um, you don't pay like a huge, crazy fee just to. Right. Show know. up and mess with their materials. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, around here. But. I did like it. The uh, professor was like, can you, um, you should do like the next level. And I'm like, I'm graduating. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, books, I would say are safe, even in with like really messed up topics. Um, because I think it's easier to put those books down versus mm -hmm. I have some issues uh, watching certain things on TV because they're people. And though it's right. fake, it's still happening. And then I think, oh, how are that, how's the actor or actress dealing with this when they cut? Right. Especially um, assault or extremely violent, like maybe like a torture scene. And like you're, you understand that it, that it's a movie, but your brain doesn't. Right. And th does that happen in a theater? I think it probably, it depends on the play. Yeah, I mean, uh, like really, really heavy. I found that backstage in a, in a heavy drama, mm -hmm. the people backstage tend to be like super lighthearted. It's mm -hmm. like, they're just kind of, that's how they tend to process. Like when they're off stage, they're like making jokes or like, did you see that one dude in the side? He was like passed out or blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Like that kind of stuff. Stuff. like it's very um 
uh, it's, it's very light. And then I find sometimes when I'm doing like heavy comedy, people are back there and they're like, start getting kind of super serious. They're like, oh, I got to time this just right. Or I got to, oh, oh, you know, you know what I mean? Like it's, uh, I, I think that some actors self-regulate that kind of stuff by, uh, uh, by balancing it with backstage and on stage. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, like in a horror movie, like, uh, like I, I know when I do film, <clears throat> And I haven't done a lot of it, but but I uh, but I know that when I'm doing it, in between takes, I'm trying to still kind of maintain my uh, um my energy in the right place, right? Like if my guy is like super serious and people are back there kind of cracking wise and everything, I'm like, all right, I don't want to get back on camera and be like Chuck being a chucklehead. You know what I mean? Yeah. I want to like maintain a little bit of this uh, gravity that I need to take back when I when the camera's on. So like, in that sense, like it feels like, it's like so start and stop uh, mm -hmm. with with film, and uh, and you can't really release your that that energy until you're like done. You know what I mean? When the when the day is over, and then you can go and like have a drink and just like, you know, let all that stuff melt away. But like I've never been in a a, a movie that's been like that dire. You know what I mean? Like heavy, heavy horror where, you know, you're being murdered or, you know, assaulted, um, stuff like that. Um, yeah, usually I'm the one doing the <laughs> assaulting. Oh, because yeah. Because I'm like the big, big dude, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, and even that, most of the stuff that I've been like a violent person in uh, has been very like comic booky. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, it's not it's not serious drama kind of style so. so I really can't speak to that but yeah yeah I know I had that well I only had that thought in my head when I heard James Marsters who played uh, Spike in Buffy the Vampire Slayer mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that episode scene read in season six where um, he is it's written in that he tries to assault Buffy and mm. James Marsters was like, I had to go to therapy for a long time after that because yes, I'm playing Spike and Spike's doing it, but technically I'm, I'm Spike at this point and it really messed him up. And I was like, Oh yeah. Okay. So I would say music and books, but I would, I think books is, Especially for the reader, not necessarily the writer, but for the reader, it would be like the safest because you can be reading a book and then something happens and you see a line that you you're like, eh, probably not. And you just put the book down and walk away. Mm -hmm. And it's you're not seeing real life people dealing it. It's in your head, which there are, you know, issues with that if you're like really imaginative, <laughs> like I can. It's like when yeah. I'm reading, right. it's a movie in my head, but at least it's not involving actors and actresses where they they cut scene and like James Marsters has to go to therapy for a really long time right. to deal with the fact that even though he was acting, he was acting out assaulting Buffy slash Sarah Michelle Geller, and right. I didn't think about that until I saw that interview. Like I guess it was ten years ago, and I was like, "Yeah, that that is true." <laughs> Oof, a little uncomfortable. Yeah, um, I I know that like you know I have I have friends that have done like more serious style stuff, and um, when I talk to them, the thing that helps them the most is like just developing a a, a very a near absolute trust with the actor that you're performing with. Um, like often these guys are already very close friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they play some guy who's, you know, about to murder somebody or assault somebody. And, you know, they say and do these awful things live on stage and, and then they have to cope with it afterwards. Um, but a lot of it, or, or it seems like the way that they, they, handle it is by communicating like a lot, like their feelings on where they are right before, their feelings on where they are right after and how to progress and, and make sure that they're they're both comfortable, 
you know, even when they're having to act like they're not in the, in the actual scene. Yeah. So communication, communication is key. Uh, yeah. and, and a lot of things, especially collaborative. Mm -hmm. work. Yeah. What do you, what was, or have you ever seen a movie or a TV show or read a book where you were like, I can't do it or maybe even acted and you can't do it. And you had to walk away. No, no, like I, I'm pretty good at partitioning that kind of stuff um, as far as like me performing wise uh, in general. Um, no, I, I don't think so. I think I'm pretty good at being able to just like separate things. Like I, I'm, I'm pretty highly imaginative too. And uh, I'm, mine isn't so much a movie in my head as it is like a kind of a cartoon mm -hmm. everything's a little mm -hmm. larger and more colorful even if it's something gravely serious um there's a there's sort of a an unreal element that i think because i have that uh, it doesn't hit as hard or as real for me mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah. Uh, the horror yeah. that I've read isn't like that. Like I keep hearing like the word extreme horror and I keep wondering if I've actually ever read extreme horror. You know what I mean? Like I've read like The Exorcist and stuff like that. And I was like, is that extreme? I'm not sure, you know, but you know, other than that, like, uh, you know, I've been told that there are like Clive Barker stories that are extreme and, and stuff like that. And I've read Clive Barker and I've and his stuff just kind of feels cartoony, you know, because it's always otherworldly and mm -hmm. uh, and stuff like that. It's usually like human on human is what disturbs me the most. Like mon yeah. monsters don't yeah. bother me because monsters are cartoons in my mind. You know? um, but when it's human on human, that's when it's a little bit more like feels more real uh, because, you know, we all know that the real monsters are people. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I've uh, I've heard that whole um, argument about uh, well, especially I think for agnostics and atheists, where it's like, well, demons, like a, a scary ghost story. <laughs> okay, that's kind of where I am too, because I don't believe in ghosts, and I'm an atheist. And then, but it will, it will, like The Exorcist, for example. There are. Um, I know a lot of Catholics that could not make it through because that's what they think it, it's real. And, right. but then they don't, well, they, they don't, some of them do, some of them don't completely mind the human on human because the bad person in the story will be going to hell because they've murdered and they've maimed and all that stuff. So they're going to get their justice, but a demon I mean, it's a demon. Like it's it's there. You can't. Well, I guess you could send it back to hell. But that's what they do. That's they're not right. humans. Um, so there's like that uh, understanding of human on human is worse because how could you do that? And you're going to hell versus well, a demon's. Uh, yeah. Which I definitely see that uh, argument. But like those go like uh oh what's that uh. I just, I guess like all those go the ghost stories and demon stories don't really get to me. Though the jump scares, why well, yeah. you gotta do that all the time? <laughs> no, those work on me. Like I, I jump scares I just, in I movies like and, and TV, just tick, I'll, I'll jump. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll go like, popcorn. and then my <laughs> husband's like, you didn't see that coming? I'm like, I yeah, did, yeah, yeah. but I didn't know like exactly when. <laughs> exactly when, and that's when it did. Did it scare the yeah, hell out of me? But I can't, I think I could read The Exorcist, which I'm, I'm, I think I'm planning to do that for Halloween, but I had to stop the movie because that hit a nerve right. with, um, the, yeah, the movie is disturbing as hell. Yeah. Yeah. The main character getting tested for like all these psychological issues. Oh, right. Um, yeah. and I was like, oh yeah, no, that happened to me. Stop it. We're not yeah. doing this again. Brutal. Thank you very much. Brutal. Yeah, and then, then also I think a little bit was learning that the actress could not get work afterwards, right. and yeah. it just messed her up 
in her acting career and I think also, you know, mentally and emotionally. Like yeah. this is a huge a movie. Heavy. Yeah, huge movie, popular. I mean, it it was controversial and huge um, response, both negative and, you know, yeah. cult. Yeah. Yeah, and so she couldn't she couldn't find anything and I think I I'm not 100% certain, but she was having financial problems because she could not find work. And I'm like, dude, that sucks. Do I want to watch yeah. one? Do I want to watch a movie where I have that in my mind? And she did a fantastic performance, but afterwards, you know, bad things were not were happening yeah. because she chose to do this movie. And then also the testing for psychological issues. <laughs> I've already did that. <laughs> I don't need to do yeah. this again. That's when shit got really real yeah. in the in the thing in the movie. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, I think the the thing that terrified me the most when I read The Exorcist the first time was not so much the the religious connotations because I'm not I'm not terribly uh, you know religious, mm -hmm. uh, but the concept of the loss of control of, yeah. over your your body and your faculties uh, that's what was the most terrifying part. Like uh, the fact that this person no longer they, they were in their body experiencing somebody else controlling them and that that was the scariest part for me as far as terror or whatever in that um particular book uh it's it's a it's a great it's a great book i i remember enjoying it i haven't read it in a long time uh, but i read the second one and it was also really good um and uh did you know that there was a guy there's an extra in um in the exorcist as well he played like one of the random doctors in that scene that you're talking about during the, the scene where there she's getting checked yeah uh one of the random orderlies in that ended up like murdering uh, a few people I... yeah like i saw this documentary about uh what was it on it was on shutter mm -hmm. which is like a kind of a you know horror based uh channel uh, and they were doing a documentary on cursed movies, and uh, they started talking about some of the stuff in The Exorcist. And apparently, one of the orderlies was a friggin' murderer. So it's yeah. crazy. So now I have trouble watching that particular scene too, but for a, a, a slightly different reason, because I'm just like, oh my god, there's that guy. Oh, dude, that's that dude. So it's messed yeah, that, up. Yeah, that happened with Sons of Anarchy. Oh yeah. This um he was he was a side character. I I barely remember his character, but it it must have been I I don't know. It wasn't just like a one episode deal. He was in quite a few, and I think they killed him off. But you know, biker gangs. Oh wow. <laughs> Whatever. But like, yeah, he killed some people, and everyone was like, um, that's Ooh. not what we experienced. What the. F like Bruh. and yeah you don't know people um sometimes which yeah, is right. like oh that's great mm. but that is really like yeah. the uh humans are monsters and i uh, i do have to remind i feel like i have to remind people when you see like a serial killer or um a serial rapist or something you're like oh though they're monsters they're not humans i'm like no they are they are. Yeah. And I think it's a disservice to us as a whole to say that they're not human because then you're pushing away the fact that humans can do horrible things. And that can be really dangerous, especially if you're, you know, saying that in front of younger adults or children, which I don't know why you'd be talking about that in front of kids, but people, hmm. you know, when I've, I've kids used just end up asking, right? <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, it's like, uh, stranger danger is real, <laughs> but, um, also, you know, people that, you know, they can be horrible as well. And, but I think, um, going back to art, I think showing that in a, in books or even film, even though it might be a little difficult to watch or you have to turn certain movies off is the best way yeah. to kind of convey that and then but also to at the end of a movie or end of a book especially if you're doing like a book club with your family 
I think it's really important to talk about. That's what my, specifically my grandmother did. And my mom didn't really care what I read. Um, she didn't necessarily buy the books, <laughs> but I would save up money and I would buy the books. And she'd be like, well, okay, that's an adult book. But, you know, if anything's uncomfortable, we'll talk about it. But I'm not going to not let you read a book because you saved up your money. You, um, it's your money. You get to choose. And then my grandmother was the same way. So I don't know if they chatted right. <laughs> or they're just, you know, uh, common like that. Yeah. But yeah, I read adult books and there were a few times where I spoke to my grandmother about certain topics, but we had a, like, it was hours long and it was a really great conversations, but you kind of have to set that up really early. Um, in like a, a parental or grandparent relationship. Um, and it helped that my grandmother had a huge library, like more books than, mm -hmm. than this. <laughs> but, nice. um, and she always read and she, she did read um, to escape because she was a, an orphan at a Catholic, uh, yeah, Catholic mm -hmm. orphanage. So, not the greatest uh, understatement. Right. And then she was adopted and was not the best household either. Um, mm. And I kind of did the same thing. Um, not a, not an orphan though, but <laughs> did not live in the greatest areas. And yeah, couldn't go outside alone, couldn't walk alone, you know, that type of stuff. And I think with books in particular, I think it's like if you go to Goodwill, I don't know, maybe it's a my area thing. I wouldn't even say East Coast thing, but in my area, they didn't, you couldn't really find movies like in uh, Goodwill or thrift stop shops or anything like that. So it was just books, books, <laughs> and you get them for a dollar or whatever dollars. And well, you're good to go. You have like 10 books for $10 versus a DVD. Yeah, totally. Expensive. Um, and sometimes you, I think when it's, uh, it's interesting, there are books that you read to, um, be entertained and to escape, which happened a lot. And then I would read like older adult books to have like an understanding that the world is not full of unicorns and rainbows because right here right now i'm hearing gunshots outside and that's not unicorns yeah. or and rainbows at i don't know pick the age so though i i there is a lot of um concern about uh younger people reading adult books but i think it can be done but you have to be a very involved parent or guardian or grandparent um but did you read book like adult books as a kid and any of them freak you out? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm trying to think of like the first. I mean, I was reading at a pretty high level early on. Um, I want to say like some of my first adult books were like Stephen King books that we had around the house. Mm -hmm. um, like I remember reading The Shining pretty early on. I remember reading... Carrie, no, did I read Carrie? I don't know. I, I remember reading a few. Other, I know I remember, I definitely remember reading The Shining when I was like, uh, like fifth or sixth grade and like totally understanding it. But I had also already seen the movie. I, uh, my folks weren't very, um, they didn't censor much of what I watched at all when I was a kid. Uh, so horror movies were like a, like a, the mainstay in our household and i remember at my youngest like i would be terrified like i would scream and hide in my room for a little bit and stuff like that i would go and like stuff myself in a closet and put a blanket over me because i'd be so terrified of like some stuff going on on tv and you know my parents would come and check on me They're like aren't you all right you doing all right there champ you know <laughs> They're like, okay we're gonna go back and watch these people get murdered you, you're good you know um 
and it was one of these things that I kind of developed. Like uh, I, I used to go from like running into my room and hiding to running behind the couch and looking at like the reflection on the window of the TV. And mm-hmm. somehow that made it feel safer for me to watch a horror movie. Um, so like, I think I got, uh, I got desensitized relatively early as a kid. Uh, I remember watching Jaws for the first time and we lived on the coast. So like the beach would terrify the shit out of me for like a couple of years after that, you know, I just couldn't put, yeah, I couldn't go higher than my waist in the water. I just did not want to do it. You know, if there was room for a shark, I didn't want, I don't want to have anything of that. Uh, so like, uh, but I wasn't like a terrified child, you know what I mean? It was just like certain things would trigger, trigger terror and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I read, I read some adult books, but I wouldn't say I read stuff that was like hardcore. Yeah. Like yeah. even now I have trouble, like I was saying, like, uh, I, even now I'm like, have I read anything hardcore? Cause I don't think I've read anything yet. that's made me go. I can't, I can't finish this. I can't, this is too much, you know? But uh, I do read a lot of like lighthearted stuff. I read a lot of classics and a lot of the heavy classical literature doesn't really go into some of that hardcore stuff. Um, you know, some of these hardcore newer horror guys, I guess. But like I, I've yet to encounter something that's too much for me to, to, to process or something that made me like have to put it down. Yeah, I have. I've had to pause. But I go back. I think that was um, it was poetry. So it's it's nonfiction. I was like, uh, yeah, let me mm, pause. <laughs> mm. This is a. Is it just something that like hit you on a, on a personal level where you just had to like yeah stop yeah. and like take a breath and yeah yeah and uh, that's why I put uh, like in the beginning is like a uh, for my fourth chat book teal nostalgia. That's the one that I put um, like a content warning in the front also because like i would say 75 percent i'll go with 75 percent of the poems uh are like non-fiction i wrote for to um get out all the emotions and the right and a lot of them were written as a exercise for trauma therapy so yeah they're mm. they would be a little much for some people but i put that up there just for that one in particular and then i for that just really just that one chat book i am not 100 percent concerned of people that say oh i didn't relate i'm glad you didn't relate I'm more concerned right. of the people that right. are like, oh, I needed this book in high school because I know exactly what mm. you're talking about. And I, I wish right. that you did have this book in high school um, or middle school um, or just any time. Um, and so I, I care a bit more about, you know, the feedback. I've gotten quite a few um, messages and emails for that one in particular, but mm. I don't take, uh, I take it the feedback with a grain of salt of, um, oh, I couldn't relate and the, the poems didn't, you know, vibe with me. So one or two stars, that's fine. I, I would welcome that. Um, and that's something that I know a lot of poets grapple with. If someone can't relate to the poem or poems, but I would say if it's a, poem of something distressing or traumatic, I would reframe that and say, I'm glad you haven't had a, let's say, traumatized um, childhood or you um, weren't, um, you know, abused as a teenager, you know, like whatever it may be. Um, And that kind of gets into like critique of art in general. A lot of people nowadays having some problems with uh, even indifferent. I'm I'm totally fine with indifferent reviews, or like negative or indifferent reviews. Um, yeah. I think though I've I've given a lot of advice of there's eight billion people in the world. You can't expect even the majority of them. Let's say hypothetically, eight billion people have. <laughs> 
grind your stuff. You would be like a trillionaire. But um, right. <laughs> but there are so many people in the world. It's just not possible to have a to have like everyone that picks up your book or poem or watches your film or anything like that to like it. So are you going to fight against that? Or are you just going to accept that you're going to have some people that are you're going to say it sucks? Right. <laughs> I think it's a little easier. I saw me. a quote by Andy Warhol that, um, that is, has been turned into a meme and I, I've seen it a million times and I always like nod my head in agreement. Oh yeah. I think I shared that. Oh, you did. Didn't you? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, yeah. It's like, just keep making art and let the people decide whether it's art or not. And while they're doing that, keep making art. You know what I mean? And that's, yeah. that's exactly, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, all forms. Doesn't I just matter. Keep building, keep building stuff. Keep making it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it's partly why I, I've moved into so many different avenues of, of just art in general, because there are times where like, even I'm sick of it, you know, I'm just like, I don't want to paint anymore, rah, rah, you know? So I'm going to, I'm going to start writing for a couple of years you know, and, uh, and stuff like that. So it's, um, it's definitely, I have to express, I must express myself, darn it. And, uh, you know, art's been the best way to do it. Uh, and, yeah. Sometimes it's a painting, sometimes it's a play, sometimes it's me doing a performance that I really want to do. Uh, I used to do stand up, you know, for a long time. Um, you know, just just pure expression. Just bam, bam, bam. Some people liked it, some people didn't. Some people bloody hated it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, uh, you know, that's the way it is. Um, yeah. In fact, honestly, I kind of like the infamy at times. Um, like here in, uh, I do a lot of these like kind of clown style shows where I'm, um, you know, just kind of doing over the top, you know, very human cartoon style. Uh, um, sometimes it feels like folks that take themselves pretty seriously don't just don't get it. You know, they're just like, well, I don't, I don't know what the fuck's going on. These guys are, these guys are silly. You know. <laughs> Um, and, uh, but the people that love it, love it. Like it's, uh, it's one of my favorite things about the, the shows that we do is we're the shows that all of the theater folks, husbands want to come and see, you know what I mean? They're like, don't take me to a play, but I will go to that show where that guy was like gyrating in the Dracula outfit. I like that one. We, we can go to that one, you know, but you know, don't take me to some play where they're just like acting their hearts out. And, uh, it's like four hours long, you know, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so we're like, I, I, I like to think our stuff is, is, is got a massive appeal because it, uh, even people that don't enjoy theater enjoy what we do. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that kind of goes into, um, um, art as just like a hobby. And then you do whatever, like a hundred percent is what you want versus, um, are you going to, are you keeping this at a hobby? And then you think about it and say, no, I actually want to, you know, put it out in the world. And then there's different, you know, branches of what that might mean. And, right. um, what do you think about when, let's say for a painting or a book, actually, I think a painting, like sculptures, paintings, even like clothing, um, knitting things that are physical and you see it right there are are easier in a way to um, show exactly what it is and have more interest and even plays it's right there but for right. a book and yeah I think it's about yeah I'm gonna just say books you have to you have a cover and then you have to have the right summary on the back or link on the Amazon sales page and you have to uh, choose the correct categories and then you have to have a, the person open up the book and invest time in reading the book <laughs> so that I think books are one of the hardest to sell as a product um, and also if like if you want to put it out in the world, Okay, 
are you going niche? Like, are you going to do like satirical urban fantasy with a mix of sci-fi thrown in there? Like that's very niche. Do you, but right. is that what you want? Or, and like you're, you're maybe, however, like even if you market amazingly, that's a very small niche. Um, do you want to be like a cult classic type of thing? Where like you have those fans, but you're not ever going to get even this big. Like you're here, you're not even going to get this big. <laughs> or um, have you like are you really um, just like into science fiction, and then you kind of narrow it down into like a subgenre of science fiction, and like well you can get this big, but you need to do um, like the correct cover. It doesn't have like you can't. There's things that the whole thing with um, covers that I've learned recently is you're not trying to tell your whole story on the cover. You have to get the person to stop scrolling and be interested and then yeah. click it. <laughs> it's so much mm -hmm. in depth, clicking, 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 or, you know, passing by in a store. Oh, that's an amazing cover. And I know exactly what that is. And I'm the ideal reader. So I'm going to go mm -hmm. into that bookstore. I'm going to buy it. And maybe I'll read the you know summary or not, but I want that product. Right. Do you think? What do you think about um, turning art into a product, or because that's that's been something that's fairly controversial lately, in, in a little bit in trad publishing, but like trad publishing is with an agent, and you have signed on to a publisher, so you know they're doing their own thing. And they make it into a product for you. But I think more so with indie publishing and even um, small press where um, there's there's more control, but especially with, you know, you just doing it, you have like all the decisions are on you. What are you going right. to like? Do you want to? Like, this is your book, baby, and you're extremely emotionally invested, and you cried your eyes out writing it the whole time, and you're like, oh, no, someone gave me three stars. I'm going to have a meltdown. <laughs> That's yeah, been right. a thing lately, and I don't know. I think three stars mm -hmm. is great, but what, what are your thoughts? Right. <laughs> well, I would definitely think that, uh, like, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. With uh, There's sort of an instant gratification for when you're just looking a thing and then you're done ex experiencing the art right so paintings it's instant gratification you just like walk in bam i like it i don't move on you know what i mean so like uh and yeah and then when it comes to a book you've got to invest all of this extra time you gotta you got to um you gotta read the bloody thing you know uh, and and that, that's where like the the real um um that's where that's where the reward is, right? It's in the it's in the reading, and you know, and I can see sometimes people can be disappointed in what they read, and you know, not not review it well. Um, and sometimes it's it, sometimes it can be at the fault of the cover. I've definitely picked up books where I've looked at the cover, read the book, and was just like, this cover is not not doing this book any favors. You know what I mean? That's that's happened before too. Um, uh, honestly, blank covered books. I I almost always look at those first, just because I'm like, what the, what's going on? And I have to like look at the titles. You know, the title almost always means a little bit more to me than the cover art, just because um, I, I want to see what the title's promising me. You know what I mean? Like sometimes the cover art can only give you like this kind of microcosm of what's going on, and at times it doesn't give you doesn't give you much of what's going on at all. You know what I mean? Um, I find the titles more intriguing personally uh, when I'm when I'm searching for books. Uh, that and other people's opinions. I like to listen to read reviews and stuff like that. I tend to be very careful about uh, picking books just because investing time in reading is um, is important because I spend a lot of time also doing a lot of other types of you know art in general. Um, yeah, I totally agree with that. With uh, with the idea that you've got to uh, you the, the 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 process that as a writer you that you have to go through is so much more uh, in depth, you know, uh, as far as like um, how you're presenting. Because yeah, you're not getting the you're not getting the satisfaction part. 
you get the satisfaction part of a painting immediately. And the satisfaction part, you've got to like lure a person to get to it and then invest the time to read it. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it also seems like folks that are there to buy books want to buy a book. They, like they're, they're there to like, I'm, I'm shopping because I want to invest some time in a book as well. So it's just like, you are, you are, sh you are selling to people who are there to buy, um, you know, but uh, it also feels like uh, since, um, since self-publishing has become such a, a bigger thing. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not speaking from any experience here. I haven't tried to self-publish mm -hmm. at all, but it feels like that you've got a, uh, um, uh, a saturation of content that it's so easy for the good stuff to not even get get pushed to the top, and usually it sounds like it's just a uh, uh, um, um, like just not knowing how the algorithms work, or or just understanding what a, a good cover does for you, or a good summary does for you, and, and stuff like that. So there's just so much more to it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I knew some things, but uh, I didn't know enough. Yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm <laughs> in the beginning. Yeah. One thing I do know is like, okay, so just as a playwright, right? Because I've been building plays for like the last 10, 15 years uh, with this one company. And I've discovered that when the title promises something that is delivered, it almost always gets a way better response. And if the title promises something that the audience can immediately see, because uh, like our first few uh, plays, we had these really fancy titles, you know what I mean? And we are, we're all like patting ourselves on the back, like, oh, we're so clever, this title, you know? And it goes over most people's heads when they see it. They're like, I don't fucking get it. What does this even mean, you know? But then we started doing titles like Disco Dracula. And they're like, I know exactly what I'm going to get when I walk into the show and see but Disco Dracula. There's going to be Disco, there's going to be Dracula, and whatever else is made, right? Uh, we did a show called Cthulhu Beach Party. And everybody like showed up for that. They were like a whole bunch of like HP Lovecraft fans, a bunch of clown fans, you know what I mean? People that love those old beach party movies. They're like, yeah, okay, what what is this? You know? uh, our audience has got larger when our titles got simpler and and kind of promised something very basic that they knew that they were going to get uh, our last show before this one was called raising harry potter and it was just, and it was uh, the poster was like a, a, a replica of uh the raising arizona poster so like they're like oh okay it's raising arizona with harry potter in it you know what i mean and uh yeah uh the audiences were bigger and uh, the, the reception was way better so um I, I think that's kind of goes back into my like idea that titles really, really matter. Um, I, I think that especially in a world where folks are uh, swiping a lot and not putting a lot of thought into the first, you know, they, into what they see. Um, yeah, if the title is simple uh, and sometimes as a writer, it's not as satisfying because you're like, oh, I had these really cool ideas for clever titles that me and five other people would totally get, you know. But uh, you got to think about the audience, too. You got to think about the people that are just like going, I don't get it next, you know. Uh, yeah. And I think uh, with all artists, not just uh, writers, um, but I, I see it more with uh, writers where they're thinking about their art as their babies. And so they want to do every single thing for their baby like we have to like it's it needs to end this way uh, yes. because the characters yes. are telling me and i and it's like okay <laughs> yes okay. okay um i used to be yeah. like that but then i was not getting any any reaction or any reads like because i was on wattpad for um a while and yeah wasn't getting anything and then i had to think about okay so why am i writing is it as a hobby no i would like to make you know i would like to have readership okay and um then it was okay i have readership but 
what else do I want? Because I'm not feeling satisfied right now. Um, and they're not interacting. They're reading, but they're not. there's nothing else there. And I have followers, but they're not interacting with me either. So what, what's, what else, you know? And so you have like all these steps to get to. <laughs> and I went through like all those steps. And it was, I want to have super fans, which are people that will read everything that I produce or like the vast majority of stuff that I produce and have them enjoy it and also interact with me. And that means that the book baby concept where I will cry over a four out of five star read, which is really good. Um, or like, like, or have like a mental breakdown because you get a three stars because you're so emotionally invested, but it doesn't connect with your audience because it's a hundred percent emotional and you didn't plan out the plot very well. And you, your dialogue is awkward and you have too many commas and you're like, you're not thinking about the craft and you're not thinking about your ideal reader. Um, right. It's something you have to grapple with. Cause I know there are like, uh, there's a geologist around here in these parts where he only writes books for other geologists. And if someone picks up that book and they're not a geologist over the heads, but who's his ideal reader, other geologists. Yes. So even niche, very niche, you have to figure out who your ideal reader is and where, how far are you going to go with that? And that also means the summary is on point, the title and the book cover. And there's also, uh, you know, uh, expectations in books as well. Like romance, you need a happily ever after or else it's not a romance and you're going to get one and two stars if the characters break up that, you know, and if you're not, if you don't have that happily ever after, then it's not a romance. And for some people, people, people are trying to change that. And like, you know, there's romantic fiction, right? That's Nicholas Sparks. You can be, you can do very well with romantic fiction. Hello, Nicholas Sparks. <laughs> like, but you, you have to do some research, which I know a lot of people don't because then it's like, well, that's not art, artistic anymore. But I think other, I think all other art, um, artistic streams do research too. Right. hundred percent. Yeah. 100%. Even I, like I don't, I don't do research for anything that I do. Like even if I'm painting something from memory, it's something that I've researched before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like even chefs, you have to put mm -hmm. ingredients together and you have to try things out or else um, it's going to not taste good and then you're going to get bad right. reviews. Or even, you know, the look of it. I don't completely care about the look, but I'm not a foodie. So, But like you have to see what's on trend and then there are things where you're like, okay, I'm going to stick with this trend, but for this dish, I'm going to create something new. But I have trending backups of, uh, you know, food, maybe like for this year, it's all about steak and potatoes for whatever reason. So you're going to just sprinkle all your, you know, creativity on steak and potatoes. But then, you know, maybe for your dessert, you have four desserts that, you know, are on trend, really popular. But then you have two other desserts that you have created, and they're popular too. But, you know, I think there's passion projects, and then like that are that might not even get you know out into the open you don't share with anyone because that's like your emotional baby or um you know you're writing out trauma or something like that i just happened to pu uh, publish my poems that were dramatic <laughs> and it's not really on trend but that's fine um there's something you needed to express. Yeah, and I think, but I think you can also do that with uh, books that are now. Um, I think first drafts or first drafts of anything um, are for you, and then you get to decide what are you going to do with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, 
And for my urban fantasy series, I did a whole new pen name and all that stuff. And I love those books dearly. Um, I did cover research. I did uh, subtitle, title, um, like what are tropes in the usual urban fantasy. And because I wrote urban or I read so much urban fantasy already, the tropes were already in there. So I didn't have to add anything. And I forget there was, is it, is he a playwright? I forget, but there's this uh, really well-known writer that had that wrote a nonfiction book. Um, of, of course, I'm forgetting that as well. <laughs> but we were having a conversation about this in my uh, writing group where if you read enough in a genre, then you unconsciously know what to put into the book, um, which that just so happened what I did because I have magical psychic sassy main character um mm -hmm. a mystery plot and it doesn't there's no happily ever after but like there's things that uh, are expected for urban fantasy just like expected for sci-fi and romance that mm -hmm. um your ideal reader would really enjoy and appreciate if you put it in there <laughs> but right. um but I still think art can be fun. I think there is a um, that stereotype of the artist has to be depressed and going through things, and art can only be like sad or angsty for it to be art. I don't. I I think that is doing a disservice to not just the reader but to the artist because what if you want to get better? Like you have depression and, you know, anxiety, but you could go to therapy and work on that. And then you come out the other end really happy. And now you want to um, write comedies now or just something fun. And you used to write something really depressing. What are your thoughts on that? And even like in theater, I'm sure it happens in theater. Yeah. Um, like, I think piggybacking on, on like what you've just said there, like, uh, the whole, like, um, no, uh, no angst, no art kind of, uh, kind of a deal. Um, yeah, I definitely don't subscribe to that, uh, to that idea either. Uh, and I don't know a lot of like artists that do, it seems to be critics that do, you know what I mean? Like most of the artists I know are like folks that are like, uh, once they have a little bit of catharsis through their art, they're like, yeah, that's great. I'm going to go do something happy now. You know what I mean? Like they, uh, it's, they need it. That's where they, <laughs> uh, one of the things that I've always kind of observed uh, is like when you listen to like a band that was really, really badass, like back in the eighties, but like now they're not as cool anymore. Their stuff isn't as hardcore or, or whatever. And like, I don't always attribute that to the fact that they're, um, that they're no longer starving or that they're no longer angry or, or whatever. Uh, to me, it almost feels like it's more about like they're trying to appeal to a larger market or they're trying to, or they're not putting as much of their um, time into some of these things. Like, um, you know, some of these guys, you know, back in the day that they ate, lived and breathed their, their, their work. And then once they finally get some comforts and have a lot of other things to deal with, you know, you, you can't write a metal song about your mortgage, but you're dealing with it. You know what I mean? So it's like uh, their attention, I think, is is in a different spot. So that, I think that's usually what, in, in my like opinion, you know, that's what it feels like it is. Like the, the but I don't think they're less of an artist or anything like that. Um, like I'm usually surprised at like guys who are like in their, 60s and 70s that are still like rocking and doing really badass shit like Ozzy Osbourne is like a great example like I'll I'll be just like surprised like somebody's like here a new Ozzy album I'll go well that probably isn't great he's, he's been doing this forever and then I'll hear like one or two songs and I'm like damn that's a really good song you know it's the jams it's got all that same darkness that I've come to appreciate from Ozzy 
or like some random new stuff that like uh, Black Sabbath will do with like these new singers that they have. Um, yeah, I mean, they still know how to they still know how to rock it. But so I think it's just one like I think there's a certain like zeitgeisty luck factor in in people's work. Right. Sometimes, like you were saying, you, you hit these trends. And sometimes it's unconscious just because there's a universal unconscious that everybody is kind of tapping into anyway, especially when they're creating art for like, you know, release, you know, to it, into the into the universe. Um, sometimes you just get lucky and you hit those little nerves that everybody's that a, a large group of people are already feeling. And it's a large group of people that are already kind of either looking at your stuff or are going to be in the vicinity of, of your stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, like you're saying, like with niche uh, niche searches on 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 Amazon, you know what I mean. Somebody who really wants to delve into some cool Irish folklore is gonna like like run into some of your stuff and be like, oh, Irish folklore, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. That's exactly what I want, you know. So sometimes it's it's uh, it's uh, serendipity, you know, stuff stuff happening all at all at the same time. Um, yeah. And uh I think it I think art imitates life and life imitates art. Mm -hmm. Very nuanced. Where um a lot of people now do not want to read extremely serious works right now because we we just had, you know, the COVID nineteen yes. pandemic and yes. they can't do it anymore. And I totally right. get it. I can't do it anymore. Am I interested in reading uh, Hemingway right now? No, I'm really, no, I'm so tired of, um, yeah. you know, the sadness. So they're yeah, looking for fun like stuff. Why, uh, like Ted Lasso is so popular. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Cause it's so, it's, it, it does grapple with some dark stuff, but it's largely a very wholesome and positive message. And people just are hungry for it right now. You know, we, we need some positivity, you guys. Like this, mm -hmm. these last few years have been bloody traumatic and just dark and everybody's a little meaner, you know? <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. I think that's why Lasso is like hitting such a big nerve with, with, uh, with a broad audience. Like, so yeah. Yes, I agree 100%. Yeah, yeah so it also, and it depends on the person and what they're going through as well and mm. so it's like zeitgeist and then artist and then readers <laughs> it's just like all up and down all just maybe it's a venn diagram just right. <laughs> uh right. because i know like the cozy fantasy like legends and lattes right got really really popular mm -hmm. all of a sudden even though they were like a couple writers um, in there and it was extremely niche and they weren't like, they were, um, they were writing it. And it, I think a lot of them were inspired by like Terry Pratchett, I guess um, like it's a little cozy or it's like humorous fantasy, but then they're like, you know, I just, I, I'll, I want to write something that's wholesome and fantasy because uh, shit's going down. Like we're doing it, and then the legend legends and lattes became popular, and I think a lot of that has to do with because Travis is an audiobook narrator and narrated really big fantasy books, and then became or friends with a lot of them because um, you have to you have to choose your narrator, and so they helped him get bigger, and he like started just indie. Um, because like no one wanted cozy fantasy, but he's like, okay, then, well, I know what to do. I'm going to do it. And then his friends shared it. And then everyone's like, I need cozy mysteries. My life's a joke. <laughs> and then boom. And now it's a thing. Yeah. And that is zeitgeist writer, reader, all mm -hmm. together. And now it's, Altogether. yeah, now it's a huge. Yeah, I've never even heard the term cozy fantasy until like the last couple of months. Yeah. And now I hear it all the time. And it's a more. more. Yeah, I yeah. need more. I want, I want right. like low stakes where no one's being, you know, killed or anything like that. But like, 
you know, things are happening and at always at the end, it's going to be happy. Right. Right. And like, yeah. And this is after like a couple of decades of George R. R. Martin and Amber Crombie, you know, just being just poor and guts and yeah. awful people and all this kind of stuff. And all of a sudden we get all these great, you know, these happy stories that are kind of wholesome and nice and <laughs> people being kind. Oh my gosh. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. And I think, <laughs> yeah. And they're like, you can't get away from hard topics because life is hard. You right. can't be a hundred percent positive. Like, you know, in legends and lattes, um, you know, there are things that happen that are tough, but it's how you write it. And do you add humor into it? And like, you know, how do you make it light and not depressing? Um, and I think that right. matters a lot. Like, my urban fantasy i think is fun art because yes you have a sassy main character but her um her life has been fairly traumatic because she can see other beings um that's her magical power and people think that she's crazy and she had to deal with the fact that no she has to lie to everyone except like people mm -hmm. like her family or um wiccans or neo-pagans or just like anyone who believes in fairies and mermaids and stuff. And so she has right. to live with the fact that she's kind of living a lie. And, you know, that alone is hard. And she has anxiety because she has to lie all the time to people that she cares about. And she can't get close uh, to a lot of people. And, but, you know, she's accepted that in a way. And because she can't change the world into seeing fairies and stuff. So right. what does she use? She uses humor and she's, mm -hmm. she has accepted that things that she can't change. And though it makes her upset at times, especially when she has to lie to her friends, uh, certain situations, well, there's other ways, you know, to deal with it. And then, but because of that magical ability, well, now she is being paid moolah from the uh, queen and king of the fae working with the vampiric detective to Ooh. solve magical murders. Why? Because she can see the people, people, the other beings that no one else can. So there's advantages and disadvantages to everything. And it's just like, how do you portray something bad, which happens? Yeah, murder happens, unfortunately, but how do you fix that problem? And I think people want problems to be solved because right now there's there's too many problems and there's no solutions. And it's, it's anxiety all the time. So I think art, even if it's funny or satirical or maybe just like lighthearted, I think is needed right now. And maybe that changes. I mean, of course, I think it goes back and forth. Like we'll maybe have a next uh, Game of Thrones, maybe in like 10 years or something. But I see this like lighthearted trend going for quite some time. <laughs> we just yeah. need it. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. And even uh, theater too. Like Disco Dracula sounds, it's hilarious. I'm like, yes, I'm going to see some yeah. Dracula and Disco. Does he do Disco? I don't know, but I'm going. <laughs> yeah. And yes, I did lots and lots there of There you disco. go. <laughs> yeah. If you had told me like five years ago, Adam, you're going to be like standing in front doing a whole bunch of Disco moves and then they'll be like, you're nuts, man. I ain't going to do it. <laughs> but I had so much fun doing it. Just like letting go, you know, because I don't like to dance like in public in general. So like, uh, you know, yeah. But we had this great um, choreographer who was one of the characters in the show and she made dancing fun. And I myself was had to like make sure I had the right attitude too. I was like, I can't be grumpy old man, like not wanting to dance. I got to like go in there wanting to. Um, so a combination of the two ended up being really, really delightful. And we definitely wrestled with some hard topics mm -hmm. in there. Like we took uh, Stoker's Dracula and turned it into kind of a, into a 
uh, gay love story between Mina and Lucy. And then Lucy goes missing at, at the disco and, and Mina's trying to like find her. Yeah. And, um, and it, you know, of course it doesn't go well for Lucy in the, in the, in the Dracula story. And we kind of um, mirrored that as well. So like there's a sad, but happy ending uh, for it. Um, we definitely tried to like add as much wholesomeness to it, but we also wanted to like maintain a little bit of grit uh, with just like the darkness of Dracula, uh, the darkness of like late stage disco era where it was just like overburdened with drugs and, and crazy people, <laughs> um, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but like all in all, you know, it was a comedy and it was designed to, for people to like walk out of there uh, smiling. Um, yeah, sometimes that can be hard to pull off, but I think if yeah. you do it well, well, then you get like a Ted Lasso. Totally. Like, and that, I think that's one of one of our tenets. I mean, like I said, we're a clown show. I keep calling ourselves a clown show, but we're, we're um, you know, we're largely comedy. Um, but comedy, uh, to make it, to make the funny more rich you have to have grounded things you have to have dark things that you can laugh at or um or just lift yourself up uh i used to love watching uh bill hicks do you ever watch bill hicks the stand-up comedian he's old school like like late 70s early 80s yeah but he was one of the guys who would set up his jokes with like this really just dark stuff he would just say dark screwy things and you're like what are you doing you know and and that was his gag was like he would just start by just making you just like lose faith in the universe you know what i mean and then boom he, he has this great take on it that uh, that'll lift you right out of it so it's all about digging this like comedy hole that he has to like you know um that he has to burst out of by the by the end of the joke or the end of the setup it's one of those, um, it, I think it's like advanced comedy. It's like the really, really hard stuff uh, is to like bring your audience down and make them like either angry or sad and then lift it, lift them out of that. And I, that makes the laugh louder and more sincere. It gives it so much more gravity, you know? Yeah. And I think of basically all comedy, I'm not like a, comic or anything but i do watch a lot of comedy it's um it's about sad or difficult topics but that's i think that's the whole point because really what i learned through uh my own therapy over the years is you have to not take everything so seriously <laughs> like i was angsty depressed hated everything what did that get me nothing it didn't get me anywhere it just kept you kept digging a hole and hole and just oh look now you're in a huge you're like you're 50 feet down under because there's you can't find anything like just just one positive one positive no because you, you can yes you can nicole <laughs> and so i changed that outlook um and got uh sorry watching more um comedies or like stand-up comics because i'm like i don't know if this is gonna i don't think this is gonna work for me <laughs> me being a little angsty teenager and yeah it took quite a few years but i'm like okay i get it like especially for my brain because i have multiple mental illnesses and it's just like i took it so seriously that it got worse because you're feeding yourself neg um, negativity and paying too close attention to like, for example, um, OCD. Uh, I took it way too seriously and I kept feeding it. And if you add fuel to the fire, you know, you get a bigger fire. <laughs> and so like I was doing way too many rituals to stop the anxiety of what if the oven is on and then it was even from 
therapy, the ERP therapy, which is exposure response prevention was, what if the oven's on? And the, you're just like, my God, I don't know. And, <laughs> and you're freaking out. And then it's like, yeah, what if, what if mm-hmm. happens? Who cares what your mind says? Right. Who cares? It would be hilarious, wouldn't it? And I'd be like, no, it's not hilarious. And you're freaking out. <laughs> and then like you, you keep freaking out and it's making it worse. Mm-hmm. But what we reframe and we say, okay, the house is going to burn down. What, what happens? Am I, am I dead? Unless I'm in the house, I'm not dead. <laughs> right. It's just, it's the <laughs> dumbest thing, but you can't make it logical because no mental illness is logical. It's not going to listen to logic. So you just, you're kind of trolling yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what comedy is. You're trolling yourself because you're writing these, mm-hmm. you know, just some stuff is just absolutely just not logical. It's, it's just ridiculous. But that's mm-hmm. why it's funny. And then right. people are watching it and you're like, I get it. Like, that's that's fucked up, but I get it. <laughs> Real life problems. I, yeah, I understand. I wouldn't say that, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, real life could be freaking absurd. And, I know. And too, you know, and, and sometimes that's just part of it. Just like accepting how damn ridiculous the world is. And uh, yeah, just kind of laughing at it. Yeah. And especially the, uh, if you can't ch- change or control something like that, you, you know, you can't, you know, there are things that you can't, but like accepting that, it, it get it's really hard at first, but once you get there and you can see the, the funny side of things, yeah, it makes things a lot easier. And I think that's also why a lot, I think a uh, light lightness or funny or cozy stuff is um, more popular now because, well, we, we personally uh, can't change what's going on right now. Uh, other than like, you can do so much. But um, the helplessness and hopelessness, those are two of the really hardest things to get over yeah. um, or to go through. And that's what we're, we're feeling a lot right now. And that's why I think comedies and just like fun art is now a thing or it was always a thing, but it has like uh, surged so fast and uh, so high. Um, and even romance or just like, you know, stuff that you don't really, it's not dark and heavy though. I have seen like, um, satirical horror. It's like mm-hmm. in a cartoonish way, like, um, Bugs Bunny silliness, like, you know, uh, ax to the head and it's set up where it's like, that could be like Bugs Bunny <laughs> doing an ax yeah. to the head to someone. So it's, yeah. It's really dark, but it's not serious. Right. It's interesting. Right. I love to see it yeah. <laughs> because I'm I'm watching like messed up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I, I love messed up stuff. Like I like it when things are a little too like a little too much. And you're just like, wow, that's messed up. But yeah, when when it's designed to be laughed at, that that's some of my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are almost at an hour and a half. And I think we just, the time flew by. I hope it uh, flew by for everyone else. I forgot that there was an audience. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. That's, that's the best. Just, yes. Just, no. <laughs> so thank you so much, Adam, and everyone watching my buttercups. <laughs> thank you for joining. I hope everyone has a great day. I hope Adam has a fantastic day, week, month, year, yes. 50,000 years. I'm just trying to make oh, it. Maybe. Yeah, I'm just trying to make it go just like as positive as possible because we're ending on right. a cozy <laughs> thought process. Cozy positive note. Yes. Cozy positive, yes. <laughs> Thank you all again. And we're going to see you in the next one. I don't have it planned out, but um, I think that is the vibe for this YouTube video. So um, everyone that has been watching, you know the vibe. (laughs) If you are new, you'll get used to it. It's okay. I get used to it. Everyone gets used to it. 
we're just winging it just kind of like life right now we're winging it but yeah. i think that's the fun part <laughs> Yeah, it is. <laughs> thank you for watching and thank you adam and i'll have all of adam's information in the description box so you can find his cool stuff thank you again have a great rest of your day exactly. night year and we'll see you in the next one whenever it happens <laughs> hey, Doc.